me begin by first introducing myself to some people who are new uh, to our events. I'm Martin Sanchez Jankowski, and I'm the director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues. Um, and I want to remind everybody that if they do have a cell phone, could they check to see if, if it's on silent? Um, one time I made that announcement and mine wasn't. <laughs> I was terribly embarrassed by this. Before we begin and before uh, I introduce our speaker today, I want to draw your attention to our next event. Uh, professor Michael Burrovoy uh, here, uh, who's a professor of sociology at, at here at UC Berkeley, will give a talk based on his comparisons of Pierre Bourdieu and Antonio Gramsci and the divergent perspectives on cultural domination that have implications for the critique of society. Um, the title of the talk is Marxism Engages Bourdieu, uh, and his talk will be on Wednesday, February the 21st, from 4 to 5.30 p.m. in this room. Um, I want to describe uh, to some of you who are also new that our speaker will, uh, will address us for 45 minutes. And this will be uh, followed by a question and answer period for roughly around a half hour. At that time, I'll come back up. And for those of you who want to ask questions or in the beginning and have a burning question right away, please raise your hand. I'll put you in the queue and call on you. And then our speaker will only have to uh, answer those questions. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce to you today Professor George Breslauer. Um, who arrived uh, here at Berkeley um, in 1971, having completed his entire education, both the BA, MA, and PhD degrees in political science from the University of Michigan. He entered uh, Berkeley as uh, assistant professor uh, and went through the ranks from assistant associate to full professor in, the, in UC Berkeley's uh, political science department. And then, as many of you know, uh, he also served the campus by becoming uh, the executive vice chancellor and provost uh, here at UC Berkeley under the uh, Robert Bergeron uh, chancellorship. He uh, has authored uh, or edited 12 books on aspects of Soviet and post-Soviet Russian politics and foreign relations. Um, he, in 2014, was elected a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, although he has officially retired, he's still a professor of the Graduate School and periodically offers courses in, uh, in, the, political in the Political Science Department on Russian politics. The title of his talk today is, How Did U.S.-Russian Relations Get So Bad? And how might they be improved? Please join me in welcoming Professor George Preston. There are a couple of extra seats that are empty here if you'd like to sit down. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Martin. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for coming out to, uh, to, to listen to this talk and, and hopefully comment on it. Uh, you know, I, I want to start by saying, um, that uh, my perceptions of the Soviet Union and my perceptions of American foreign policy have always been sort of middle of the road and moderate. Um, I was a fan of Kissinger's strategy of detente, even though it fell apart in the end. Uh, I've never been one of those whose initial inclination when something goes wrong internationally is to blame America first, as they say. Uh, that So, uh, <coughs> I preface my talk by saying that because um, uh, I'm going to be very hard on American foreign policy today. And um, uh, that, is, that is a product of a long-term long consideration of uh, what the United States has been up to, what Russia has been up to, and what their relations have become. Now, there are two basic perspectives on how we got to this conf confrontational relationship. I'm going to start talking, or start my talk with, uh, my interpretation of how we got here. And then I'm going to pivot to uh, were the political will there 
uh, what kinds of improvements in Russian-American relations might be possible and by what means. Um, it's not a particularly optimistic uh, uh, talk uh, for reasons you'll, you'll, you'll come to uh, understand. So there are two basic perspectives on how we got here. There are out there in some of the literature occasionally more nuanced uh, syntheses of some of these, but uh, the two basic perspectives are that Putin is the prime mover, the imperialistic thug who got us to this point, and uh, that's, that has to be our primary causal, uh, causal attribution. Uh, by contrast, there's the view of Putin as reactive to international provocation. And I, I buy into this. Uh, I believe we brought this problem upon ourselves over the course of the last uh, almost 30 years. Now, when I say provocation, uh, I see four elements that have combined in American foreign policy that have created, <coughs> eventually created, both indignation and contempt in the leadership in Moscow and the political elite in Moscow toward Washington. Uh, one issue was NATO expansion. Uh, this began already under Bill Clinton in the 1990s. Uh, in 1999, several Warsaw Pact or formerly Warsaw Pact countries were brought into NATO. Uh, five years later, the Baltic states were brought into NATO and uh, several other uh, Warsaw Pact countries. And then uh, from, from 2006 onward, there was deliberation within NATO about the terms under which and the time frame through which Ukraine and Georgia might be brought into NATO as well. Uh, to Moscow, this was at best obliviousness to Moscow's national interests, at worst a, an effort to uh, basically assert American ascendancy vis-a-vis -vis Russia and uh, put Russia basically into a corner that was uh, uh, fashioned for it uh, through sort of encirclement of its western borders with, uh, with NATO members. Uh, it w I'll talk about the concrete reaction in Moscow uh, and why it evolved into one of contempt uh, in just a minute. But if NATO expansion was one issue, another issue was democracy promotion. Uh, democracy promotion from the Bill Clinton administration onward became a touchstone of American foreign policy. It was missionary, and it's well described in a recent book by Michael Mandelbaum called Mission Failure, in which he's highlighting both the American uh, missionary streak and, its, uh, uh, and America's inability to realize the fruits of what it was trying to do through democracy promotion. And this was uh, perceived in Moscow as uh, an attraction to regime change when it suited Washington's interests. Uh, democracy <coughs> promotion had been touted as the post-Cold War mission of the United States, and uh, there were a lot of non-democratic countries in the world that found that rather threatening. Uh, I'm not against democracy, but I am, in f I am in favor of pragmatism in trying to advance both your values and your interests so that it does not become a counterproductive effort, and all too often it became a counterproductive effort. Um, in Ukraine and Georgia, we were encouraging uh, democracy promotion from afar uh, and sometimes close in. The Ukrainian revolution of 2014 was not a product of U.S. instigation, but it was certainly cheered on by American diplomats, several of whom were on the ground in Kiev, cheering it on and trying to coordinate uh, with the revolutionaries over the uh, issue of who would be the next president. So, and it just so happened that one of them was an assistant secretary of state whose uh, telephone had been wiretapped. And so the Kremlin knew that this assistant secretary of state was talking about who should be the next uh, president of Ukraine. And so even if, uh, if you argue that uh, the Ukrainian revolution was indigenously inspired and not a product of American instigation, nonetheless for Moscow seeing the American reaction to it, uh, it became just part of a continuous process of obliviousness to Russia's national interests. And then there was a, a third uh, component of this series of provocations that I'll call the unilateral definition of norms of appropriate international conduct. 
unilateral on the part of the United States. So when, when George Bush became, George W. Bush became president, he unilaterally abrogated the anti-ballistic missile treaty, followed by efforts to set up an ABM system in Eastern Europe, all the time declaring American innocence of uh, malintent toward Russia. Um, our policies in Serbia and in Kosovo, in Libya, in Iraq, Iran, Syria, uh, they, they were viewed as we decide what we want to do, whether you like it or not, and even if it is un inconsistent with the norms of international behavior that we've been touting, that's our business, not yours. So Kosovo is a good example because Putin keeps mentioning it uh, as a counterpoint to Crimea. When Crimea was occupied by Russian troops and voted either honestly or not honestly, I can't speak to that, uh, for secession from Ukraine and then for becoming part of Russia, uh, the West declared that to be the first violation of a most important norm of international relations since World War II. And that important norm of international relations was uh, that borders shall not be changed through force. Now, Putin then thought back on Kosovo and saw that, well, Kosovo seceded from Serbia as a result of NATO intervention, otherwise it would have been crushed. I at the time supported that. I thought it was a noble thing to do if the alternative was going to be ethnic cleansing of the Kosovars by uh, Serbian troops. But that's not the issue here. The issue is, well, wasn't that a violation of that norm that you claim that we are now uniquely violating for the first time? Uh, true, we didn't annex Kosovo and he annexed Crimea, but that was not the issue when talking about the norm of changing borders through force. Um, Libya, in 2011, um, when Russia was induced to endorse humanitarian intervention in Libya in order to protect the civilians from uh, slaughter by a regime that was feeling on the defensive and facing uh, facing uh, uh, military challenge internally. Uh, Russia was persuaded to go along with the notion that NATO would intervene there, but was told that it was simply a matter of humanitarian intervention, not regime change. Well, only in a matter of days it turned into regime change, whether that was a product of internal Libyan forces or a product of, uh, of emboldenment by the external uh, external intervention, Putin was, Putin was livid after that because he felt he had been drawn into endorsing something, the outcome of which he had been promised would not be the case. Um, and that just deepened the indignation. Um, but in addition to NATO expansion and the uh, democracy promotion and the unilateral definition of the norms of international relations, Russian, Ru the Russian leadership also perceived the United States to be incompetent in advancing its goals. They don't know what they're doing. And so indignation then got paired with contempt. Because if, if you lose all respect for the, for the object of your indignation, you add contempt to that because they, 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 they look just to be, uh, to be uh, looking out for themselves and not realizing what a poor job they're doing. So uh, the decapitation of the leadership in Iraq came to be perceived as with Libya and the decapitation of Gaddafi as leading simply to a failed state that would uh, be uh, a breeding ground for, uh, for terrorism and that uh, the United States did not want that outcome but the United States through these decapitations made it possible. Uh, initially they thought we were going to try to take down Assad in Syria and we certainly gave that uh, significant thought uh, but Putin persuaded uh, Obama to back off of that. The financial collapse of 2008 uh, is another example of where Moscow looked out on the world and saw a United States that had a combination of hubris and incompetence. And uh, the financial collapse began with uh, 
the CDOs and the and the, the housing uh, housing um, mortgage crisis in the United States, and then spread to Western Europe and the Russian stock market tanked by 75 percent shortly thereafter. Uh, and so that was another example of where uh, the Kremlin would view the United States as having negative international effects uh, while claiming uh, to be a savior. Now, let me make something clear. They don't fear that NATO is going to invade Russia, but they do fear that the United States wants to sow the seeds of regime change within Russia and to encroach as closely as possible on Russia's borders, both militarily and by sowing seeds of regime change in other states of the former Soviet Union. Now, whether they are correct or not about any given American president's deepest motives, no great power would countenance this. Uh, imagine if the same thing happened in Mexico as happened in Kiev with the Russian ambassador in the square encouraging the revolutionaries. Uh, think back, let's see, there are a good number of people here my age, so think back to the Cuban Missile Crisis and how hysterical we got about just communism in Cuba, even before Soviet missiles went in toward the end of 1962. Uh, communism in Cuba created almost a hysteria in the United States. Uh, Cuba is not Ukraine. Ukraine uh, goes back a long way with Russia. Why is it so sensitive? I think the sensitivity about Ukraine is that the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union was a contiguous empire. It was not an overseas empire. So that when that empire collapses, neo-imperial nostalgia, which is inevitable, it's just a matter of whether, wh whether it becomes dominant and what form uh, it takes in terms of expressing itself uh, in foreign policy. But neo-imperial nostalgia with a contiguous empire comes to be defined as a national security threat, a national security issue. Uh, Britain did not like giving up India, but what happened on India's borders was not a national security threat to Great Britain. Uh, Ukraine has this long border with Russia, goes back many hundreds of years with Russia, and uh, is viewed by uh, by historians of Russia and the, the Russian, you might say, historical mentality as the origin of the Russian, the, what eventually became the Russian state as originating in Kiev and Rus. That doesn't mean they have a right to take back Ukraine. I'm not advocating that. I'm simply trying to explain why what happens in Ukraine, given the length of the border and the length of the historical association and the depth of the historical association, uh, creates so much uh, neuralgia, let's say, in, uh, in Moscow. And in fact, this is not unique to Putin. If you go back to the Yeltsin era, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, s the states of the former <coughs> Soviet Union were referred to by the regime as the near abroad. Interesting concept. Uh, I, I, I viewed the analogy there between the Monroe Doctrine for Latin America on the part of the United States in the early 19th century and the concept of the near abroad. That is to say, this is not just a foreign policy issue. What happens in these states is of proximate concern to us and to our national interests. And indeed, the, the greatest foreign policy challenge for Moscow since the collapse of the USSR has been Moscow's tortured effort to manage the loss of its empire. They came to terms with it, uh, in certain respects admirably so, uh, but they were aghast that the United States and NATO saw it as an opportunity to exploit rather than a turning point in history that could lead to a more collaborative and mutually understanding relationship uh, between previous adversaries. Their deepest fear after the Soviet collapse was that Russia would disintegrate as well, and that's why they ended up fighting two civil wars in Chechnya to keep Russia uh, whole. Um, not, I'm not necessarily saying that was a good thing or a nice thing, but I think from an explanatory standpoint, holding Russia together was their first uh, priority and thereafter uh, preventing external powers from exploiting the fact that the near abroad, the states of the former Soviet Union, were now independent. Now, all this built up over time. 
initially with Yeltsin, there, there was disorientation. They, they couldn't figure out why we were doing what we were doing with NATO expansion. They thought they were the good guys. They had overthrown communism. Uh, Gorbachev suggested, what, well, when, when the reunification of Germany uh, in, within NATO took place, Gorbachev suggested, well, why don't we join NATO, Russia? And he suggested that to the West. Yeltsin also suggested to the West that they join NATO. Putin eventually suggested, can't we join NATO? Uh, they, they either got no response or just got a, uh, a response that would have been more along the lines of, you've got to be kidding. Uh, but then how do they explain NATO expansion if you've got to be kidding? Uh, NATO was set up as an alliance to prevent the Soviet Union from expanding westward into Western Europe. Uh, communism is overthrown. A, a uh, regime comes to power in, in, in Moscow under uh, Boris Yeltsin that was at the lead of overthrowing the, uh, the Communist Party and overthrowing uh, effectively the Soviet Union and declaring Russian independence. And, and so how, how, when you see then that in 1994, NATO votes to add Warsaw Pact countries to it, how do you explain that among your advisors to fellow politicians in Moscow? It was baffling. So there was a sense of disorientation. As it went on and more and more countries came to be added to NATO, next wave, the Baltic countries, now this was the first time former republics of the former Soviet Union were being added to NATO, but the Baltics always had some sort of a special status. I think they, while they were angry, they, they, uh, they were not spitting bullets. Uh, Ukraine and Georgia, that was a different matter. Uh, now, now you're going into the heart, and they had never been defined as exceptions. So this built up over time, and that very fact going from disorientation to, to uh, anger to fury, you might say, uh, can't be explained simply as a product of Putin's personality. Almost all members of his administration shared that attitude toward what Washington w was doing. And in fact, Yeltsin, um, realizing what was, finally realizing what was going on, said to um, an American diplomat, uh, or president, I don't remember exactly where he went, where and when he said it. He said, Russia will rise again. Uh, that was not meant to be a threat. That was meant to indicate, you know, we have a self-conception of as a great power, we're geographically the largest country in the world, we're in an utter mess at the moment, but don't think that's going to last for 20, 30 years. Russia will rise mm -hmm. again, and you will end up regretting how you treated her in her moment of greatest need. Um, George Kennan at the time, one of our great diplomats, when he saw NATO expansion in 1999, he said, my God, this is going to come back to haunt us. Uh, now, Putin initially hoped he could strike a deal with the United States, and as I said, also suggested joining NATO. But it became clear to him, as time went on, that the U.S. was inclined to strike deals only on our terms, whether that was under Bill Clinton or under uh, George W. Bush. Uh, there was a cacophony in Washington. We won the Cold War. We are the hegemonic power in the international system. We are the, uh, the, the country that now has the capacity to call the shots in international relations. I remember we had a uh, talk here in the early 1990s, I think it was up at the Goldman School, by someone from one of the labs who was really far to the right. And I was sitting in the audience and I, I was pretty aghast when I heard this and he said, you know, we won the Cold War, we have vastly greater <coughs> military capability than anybody else in the world, than any adversaries combined. We call the shots and nobody can do anything about it. And I thought, whoa. But over time, increasingly, I saw this not just from individual scientists um, engaging in, in that kind of braggadocio, but, but by, uh, by uh, politicians in Washington, D.C. When Ash Carter was, uh, was nominated as defense secretary 
uh, he declared that Russia is, quote, the greatest existential threat to the United States. And I asked myself, well, well, that's either self-evident, because they're the only ones that can wipe us out, because they're the only ones that have enough nuclear weapons to do it, or it's preposterous if it is a statement about Russia's intentions or Putin's intentions. Uh, existential threat to the United States. Uh, existential means <laughs> make you non-existent. Um, and I think that this sequence of events better explains his responses than does reference to his personality, his KGB background, or whatever. I'm not saying, <clears throat> by the way, I, I want to make this clear as well. Putin's an authoritarian, and he rules over an authoritarian regime, and he does not like criticism of his leadership, and he uh, does not want that authoritarian regime to be challenged by what came to be called a color revolution that's happened in Ukraine and Georgia and Kyrgyzstan. In fact, uh, Stephen Lee Myers in his, in his uh, book, The Red Czar, which is by no means an apologia for, for, uh, for Putin, uh, uh, reports that when Putin w visited China once, he took the Chinese leader by, by the lapels and shook him and said, don't you realize that your policy is going to lead to a color revolution? Well, um, that's, uh, that's indicative, I think, of his fear of disorder. Uh, now, you could, you, know, you could have an entirely separate argument about whether uh, democracy would work in Russia, whether disorder is worse than authoritarianism, what have you. That's not the issue here. The point is, however, I view the Putin regime as an authoritarian regime and Putin as an authoritarian. I don't know enough about his personality, his conflicting testimony about his deepest personality. I'm just struck by the fact that he never smiles. Um, <laughs> and uh, even, I, I think I saw a photograph after he got married, in fact, in which she was smiling and he, he wasn't. Um, <laughs> so I don't know enough about his personality to, but I just, my instinct is I wouldn't want him to marry my daughter. Um, so, as Putin realized what was happening, that Washington was not going to be responsive to Russian, uh, Russian uh, counter-arguments or appeals or uh, anger, uh, Putin entertained more drastic options to impress on the United States and NATO that Russia could and would defend its interests and, if further provoked, go even farther. But Putin's foreign pol policy posture in the years after coming to power in 2000 was highly pragmatic and accommodative. It was not thuggish at all. Putin was not initially predisposed to think the worst about U.S. intentions. He has a pragmatic streak, and he displayed it back then. He called at that time in 2000 for a U.S.-Russian alliance against militant Islamic terrorism. Stephen Lee Myers, who interviewed people from within the Kremlin, reports that the first comment he made to his aides after the 9-11 attacks were reported were, we need to help them. We need to help them. Now, this is a country that in 99 it had a wave of, uh, of adhe adherence to, uh, to NATO. And he was the first foreign leader to call George W. Bush uh, to express his condolences after the 9-11 attacks. At the time, he called for a new European security architecture that could integrate Russia into a common security regime. He helped the United States extensively with overflight rights and I intelligence uh, as we prosecuted the war in Afghanistan beginning in the end of 2001. He helped us during the negotiations with Iran whether you consider that he helped us enough or not depends perhaps on your, your perspective on the, the agreement that was reached uh, over the Iranian nuclear uh, program. But this was all undercut by a strong resurgence of the missionary streak in U.S. foreign policy under George W. Bush. Uh, and in fact, I, I like to think of this historically as, as out-of-phase cycles in U.S. and Russian <coughs> foreign policy that you had in Kissinger, for example, 
a pragmatist <coughs> who uh, was not looking to crusade, but rather to cut losses and to, uh, and to stabilize the international order at a time when the Soviets had an ideology that called for, an for anti-imperialist struggle and that delegitimized itself if they did not act upon that, uh, that impulse and that commitment. Uh, and then just when the Soviet Union gets overthrown and, uh, and, and pragmatists come to power in Moscow, crusaders come to power in Washington. So we've got this out of phase, uh, out of phase cycles in U.S. and foreign uh, Russian foreign policy. But Russia, if you if you look at all the speeches that Putin and his foreign minister have given over time, uh, and, and they're not just eyewash. These speeches are reflective of their perspective on international relations. Uh, they um, they seek a balance of power approach to international <laughs> relations and a sphere of influence approach uh, to international relations. And that has been, of course, very much at odds with, uh, with American, the Amer American missionary streak, both vis-a-vis -vis NATO expansion and democracy promotion. So that the result was that continuing frustration in Ukraine and a perception that the US would not respect any red lines that Moscow had drawn led to a determination in Moscow to defend their interests in a dramatic way. And that led them to invade Georgia in 2008 in response to clear Georgian provocations. Uh, provocation, incidentally, that I think was a product of the president of Georgia being emboldened by the prospect of NATO membership down the line and therefore assuming that NATO would protect him if Russia got surly with him. Uh, NATO didn't protect him, couldn't protect him, and Moscow showed uh, that that was uh, truly the case. And similarly with Crimea, similarly with the East Ukraine insurgency, where Moscow has clearly sent uh, many military, uh, military forces into Eastern Ukraine to stoke that insurgency. The tendency is then to see these dramatic, anger-driven demonstrations of red lines here and no farther as a sign that, you see, we told you he's a thug. But if you buy into the alternative explanation that he was driven to this by growing provocation over time, then you wouldn't necessarily attribute the what is increasingly anger-inducing behavior, whether in Crimea or in eastern Ukraine or in Georgia, uh, you wouldn't attribute it to the original principle that he is a thug and now he's showing his true colors. Rather, I think... Putin, who still espouses a balance of power, spheres of influence approach uh, to international relations, uh, is seeking wherever he can to demonstrate that he has leverage. Um, I can't really speak with authority to what the answer is about how much Russian interference there was in the 2016 election. Uh, it's plausible to me that there was significant interference, whether it made the difference in the election, I doubt. But this would have been consistent with Putin's efforts, which he has exercised in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, the Baltics, uh, and in Ukraine, to use uh, cyber capacity to demonstrate that Russia can strike back too, even if it doesn't do it by symmetrical conventional military means. Uh, and. I'll get to what that implies about the future of the Russian-American uh, uh, relationship. I'm not going to speak to whether the Trump campaign colluded with Russia. I, I, I'd have to be in the intelligence services, and not, maybe not even then, to be able to, to, to make a flat-footed statement on that. I will, I will say that it's plausible to me that they may be supplying oil to North Korea in circumvention of the, um, <coughs> of the sanctions. Uh, I would attribute that not to their irreconcilable antagonism toward the West, seeking to bring down the West as best they can, so much as demonstration that they can create leverage that we have to acknowledge and then bargain over. So how do we de-escalate this and set the, the stage for broader solutions to problems? Um, I think there are two types of issues. You can divide it into two types of issues. Uh, one are bilateral issues in which both sides have an equivalent stake. 
You don't have to br bring in lots of other countries to deal with these. Uh, and you don't have to deal with the fact that it's important to the Americans but not the Russians or vice versa. And then, then there are the multilateral issues in which the stakes may be non-equivalent or asymmetrical. And those are much more difficult to handle. So bilateral issues means that the United States and Russia can address them without having to draw in other countries and can bargain over them because they both have an equal stake in a particular type of outcome. Neither side, to take one, neither side has an interest in accidental military confrontation that could escalate, whether in the Baltics, whether in Scandinavia, whether in Syria. Uh, Russia has been uh, engaged in military action in Syria, so is the United States. Uh, that uh, is a game, has, it looks like a game of either tit for tat or chicken. Who's going to blink first? Uh, it's a dangerous game. Both sides tend to play it. It's probably, to me, the most urgent and the most feasible issue to address. It assumes that both sides have to take a deep breath and that both military and civilian leaders work together in closed sessions to bring this about. You could have warning systems. You could have hotlines. You could have mutual avoidance agreements in Syria in particular. We have been working toward that. The model in my mind here is, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the relationship between Kennedy and Khrushchev, where basically they, they set up a hotline and they, they, they advanced other areas of mutual uh, negotiation and bargaining in the arms control realm uh, because they had come so close to the Armageddon and they didn't want to, uh, to have that happen again. So that, that could be a historical analogy there. Cybersecurity. Um, this is a much larger issue than whether Russia interfered in the U.S. election through hacking. The United States has a cybersecurity capability, Edward Snowden uh, notwithstanding, has a cybersecurity capability equal to that of, of Russia's. And so if the United States uh, were to play hardball on this issue, assuming it was seeking to, to uh, negotiate a mutual avoidance regime, uh, we, would, uh, we would trade assurances that we're not going to, uh, to use cyber attacks in either direction. Um, you can imagine if that escalated how dangerous that would be because cyber attack could bring down entire electrical grids, for example, or, or worse yet, it could bring down command and control uh, of nuclear weapons. Counterterrorism is another obvious area in which the United States and Russia could collaborate. This is not a not for purposes of avoiding collision so much as having a synergistic effect on outcomes that both desire. Security of weapons of mass destruction is another area in which both sides have symmetrical interests. And nuclear arms control of several sites as well, where it's bilateral. But how to reach broader settlements? Here the focus is on multilateral issues that require broader participation and negotiations, and issues in which the US and Russia and others have different, probably non-equivalent stakes or values. The Ukraine is, is one of those. I don't know what the solution to the Ukraine crisis is. Uh, the best I can come up with is Austria 1955, where Austria was occupied at the time by Soviet, American, and British troops and it was occupied until 1955, 10 years after World War II. And they mutually agreed that in exchange for, uh, for all withdrawing their troops and in exchange for letting Austria proceed to build a de democratic regime, if that was its will, uh, Austria would join no military alliance, not NATO, not the Warsaw Pact. Uh, I, could, I could imagine that part of the settlement on Ukraine, if there's going to be one, would, uh, would be along those lines where there would be uh, a long-term commitment never to join either NATO or uh, uh, the, the Russian security zone. Um, whether you could sell that to the leadership in, in Ukraine is highly problematic, uh, but if, it, if you could pull this off, it would be a major accomplishment. There would probably also have to be certain changes within the Ukrainian constitution uh, that would buy off the uh, eastern regions of Ukraine. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible for me to imagine Russia giving Crimea back uh, 
to Ukraine. Um, they, they just view that as part of their patrimony. Uh, it was part of the Russian Republic until 1954, when Khrushchev, just on a whim, gave it to Ukraine as an anniversary present. Uh, but that was just a change of administrative lines within the Soviet Union, so it wasn't equivalent to Kosovo, for example. Uh, and uh, so, you know, 1954 is not all that long ago, and so the Russian leadership feels pretty sanctimonious about Crimea. What's more, they feel they have a deep national security stake there because that is where their Sevastopol is where their their uh, uh, fleet, Black Sea Black Sea fleet, had a 42-year lease, and they're not going to put the continuation of that lease up to the whims of Ukrainian politics. Uh, maybe the model is, is how the German question was stabilized in 1969 to 71, um, but I think the Austria 1955 model is probably the best. There are all kinds of other extremely complex areas in which the stakes are higher for one side than the other. Clearly the stakes for Russia and Ukraine are higher than the stakes for the United States and Ukraine, unless you're going to define stakes purely in value terms as democracy promotion and autonomy from Russian, uh, Russian influence. The European security architecture it could be up for negotiation. Uh, Syria is an area in which uh, many actors are going to have to be involved in trying to settle that, that situation if it's possible. North Korea as well. Nuclear proliferation as a broader issue, and climate change, which you might want to put into the first category, except that it is a multilateral issue, but everybody's got a stake in climate change, uh, preve prevention of climate change, uh, even if they have not yet uh, come to, uh, to uh, admit it. So is there hope? Uh, can breakthroughs be negotiated without a big crisis first sobering people up? You know, that's what happened with the Cuban Missile Crisis. We went into a steady escalation after, after the U-2 uh, incident of May 1960, a steady escalation through 61, the Berlin Wall, then the Cuban Missile Crisis. Finally, after that, the, the mutual fright led to a detente that was short-lived because a year later, Kennedy got shot, and a year after that, Khrushchev got overthrown. Uh, but um, that... I was at a talk by a Russian journalist who's sort of a dissident within Moscow, spends a lot of time in the United States, but continues his journalistic work. And um, he, said, he said, you know, much of what Putin's doing is because he's really angry about what the United States is doing. So that's when I sat up, you know, paid close attention. So I then, during the Q&A, I asked them, okay, I was intrigued by that observation. Um, tell me, uh, we know that Putin has gotten increasingly indignant and contemptuous. Is Putin retrievable if there is a breakthrough, a political breakthrough that allows for a more forthcoming American foreign policy that is more sensitive to Russian interests? And he immediately said, you know, Putin may be angry, but he's got a pragmatic streak in him. And this is a guy who's no fan of Putin. He said he's got a pragmatic streak in him. Yes, he is retrievable. Um, I was very happy to hear that. Um, so what, what do we mean then, because this really gets to the issue of leadership in, in the international system. It's said that the United States is an indispensable leader, that it has been the leader of the liberal international order since World War II, uh, and that uh, the credibility of American commitments are all important. That credibility is indivisible. If you don't keep your commitment in one part of the world, they won't believe you in the other part of the world. Uh, that has all been the rationale for uh, a lot of warfare that the United States has been engaged in and uh, usually not to very good effect. Uh, can there be a collective leadership in the world today? Uh, Andrei Tsigankov, uh, who's a very good uh, specialist on Russia at San Francisco State University, uh, had a very nice uh, uh, short journalistic article in which he said, 
a new international system is emerging as the balance of power internationally starts to shift. The United States can no longer have its way whenever it wishes. China is rising. Russia is coming back. Uh, there, uh, you can no longer uh, hope to achieve an international order in which Washington is basically the uh, dominant or the hegemonic leader. And so he says, we have to come to terms with that or we'll find ourselves repeatedly frustrated in efforts to get our way and to demonize those who will have a growing incentive and an ability to play spoiler in the face of our unilateral efforts. So I think mutual avoidance has the best chance of a collaborative regime between Russia and the United States if the political will is there. Broader settlements are more ambitious and less likely. I'm rather pessimistic about the near term because I don't see the kind of constancy in Washington that you need. Uh, Daniel uh, Kahneman wrote this wonderful book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, in which he distinguished between system one thinkers and system two thinkers. Donald Trump is a system one thinker. He's intuitive. He doesn't think things through. He just he leaps before he looks and thinks. And uh, Kissinger was probably a system two thinker, you know, uh, deliberative and uh, not just intuitive, calculative and not just impulsive. Uh, you're going to have to have deliberative thinking on both sides in order to reach even the, the simpler to reach agreements about mutual avoidance of confrontation. Uh, it requires you setting up working groups that are going to develop a shared framing. You have to give a charge to those Russian-American working groups that is realistic, that gives them direction. You have to then institutionalize the results of the bargaining, uh, both for purposes of implementation, for purposes of political consensus building, and for purposes of, dur uh, of durability of whatever agreements you reach. Uh, system one thinkers typically can't easily do that, and certainly President Trump has not shown much patience for system two thinking. Um, and so I'm, I'm not even optimistic about the, the likelihood of, uh, of uh, bilateral agreements that are geared simply toward mutual avoidance. Uh, you may end up with tacit mutual avoidance, uh, as is probably happening day after day in Syria these days. Uh, but uh, uh, a, a, a series of agreements, deals, bargains that would institutionalize that mutual avoidance, I think, is, uh, is, is more likely to not happen than to happen. I hope I'm wrong. Thank you. For those of you who want to ask questions right now, please raise your hand. And for those of you who get a question along the way, please raise your hand and I'll put you in the queue. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask you, sir, uh, what credibility you give to those who claim that James Baker and uh, others have, in fact, assured the Russian leadership um, that there would be no expansion of NATO. Yeah. Um, there was back in 1990 uh, interaction between James Baker and his team and the Russian leadership, or the Soviet leadership at the time, Gorbachev was still in power that uh, addressed the issue of, of German reunification. And in that context, there was the, the issue of NATO uh, expansion arose naturally because if Germany <coughs> reunified, uh, that means that East Germany would be joining NATO. Gorbachev's preferred outcome was that Germany, if it had to be reunified, which he hoped would not happen soon, would, would uh, not stay in NATO, that the unified Germany would not. There, um, there is quite some evidence to suggest that such an assurance was given verbally, never in, never in writing, and could have been interpreted ambiguously. Uh, there's a researcher at Harvard who seeks to, to uh, document the counter-argument by saying, the Russians should never have drawn that conclusion from what we said. And we never put it in writing anyway, so they should not have considered it a durable commitment. Um, 
I find that a bit of an apologia because uh, if they were giving verbal reassurance uh, as it looks like they were, um, we sure didn't follow up on it, and that was you know the first instance of their feeling betrayed. Thank you, Frank. Yeah, terrific talk. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I was wondering, one example of your cooperation would be the destruction of the stockpiles of chemical weapons in Syria, which yeah. seems to have served both the Soviet Union and the U.S. in terms of getting weapons out of the hands of potential terrorists if the security broke down. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when, when Obama <coughs> uh, drew a red line in Syria that uh, the Syrian President Assad <coughs> violated, <coughs> Obama was torn about whether he was going to defend that red line and now go in. And Putin really pulled his chestnuts out of the fire, Obama's, by saying, look, I will get Assad to give up his chemical weapons because the red line was no use of chemical weapons, but he, he used them. Uh, and so, so I will get Putin to, uh, I will get <coughs> Assad to give up his chemical weapons if you will not go into Syria. They, they feared that we were going to try to decapitate the Syrian leadership as we had uh, with the Iraqi and, and the, the Libyan. Uh, and they, they had drawn the conclusion that all that does is create failed, <coughs> state, failed states that become breeding grounds for terrorism. Um, several years after that, uh, reports in the American press argued, and I'd be very interested if anybody here knows more about this than I do, that Assad kept some chemical weapons and actually used them more recently. I can't evaluate that. I think probably only people in the intelligence agencies would have a better fix on it. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily buy whatever I read in American newspapers because there's such a, an anti-Russia hysteria in Washington, D.C. right now that would make it, make it difficult even for this more limited collaboration bilateral <laughs> on uh, mutual avoidance, uh, make it even uh, very difficult for that to be politically institutionalized, in part because whoever advocated for it would be accused of consorting with the enemy. Um, so I don't know whether Assad kept some chemical weapons and then used them more recently, <coughs> although there have been reports in the Western press to that effect. Yes, sir. Suppose you're a president and you're a time to think or something, and you want to set up a committee to deal with the problem in Syria. You're going to get two or three State Department people who are going to. I, I'm not sure how this is going to end or how you could end it. But what, what's the phrase you can use? Mutual. Mutual avoidance? Mutual yeah. avoidance. Well, in the Syrian context, mutual avoidance simply means uh, since we're both fighting there and we're, we're both flying jets or our allies are flying jets, we don't want a Russian and an American jet to fire on each other. So that, that's what I mean by mutual avoidance. Settling the Syrian conflict is a much broader matter. And here you, you, you see uh, Putin being quite diplomatically active on that uh, front by bringing together Iran and Turkey and Syria to, uh, to uh, round, round table type discussions. I don't know how far they're going to get with that. It is such a mess on the ground there. There are so many conflicting interests and, and forces that uh, uh, I don't know whether uh, Putin will, will be able to pull anything off along these lines, uh, but it is the fact that he is trying is a manifestation of the fact that he's trying to demonstrate, look, I can be an international broker too. You, you have for decades now been claiming that you're the only honest broker in the Middle East. Well, I, I'll show you otherwise. Yes, sir. <coughs> Thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Rupert Berg. I come from Krakow, Poland. Uh, so, uh, no need to say that, let's say, the uh, way you argument is, uh, I mean, the way the Russian US relations are so in central, in particular, in my country, is different. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but it was great to hear, hear that view. I got two questions actually. Uh, one related to, uh, to this uh, cybersecurity. You mentioned that it is. Uh, one of those things which may be settled during bilateral communication mm -hmm. because the stakes are equal. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my sense is that the, there are no equal stakes in terms of cyber security between the authoritarian regime and democratic regime because in one you may manipulate elections, in the other you just can't do it. Uh, 
So well, well, we do speak cybersecurity in a very like military offensive terms, uh, birds and electric birds, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> the states are equal. But when we speak about man electron manipulation, clearly uh, authoritarian regimes are in a, well, it is asymmetrical. That is my view. I would like, I would like mm -hmm. to hear your comments. And the second short uh, uh, question is about Ukraine. It is, uh, of course, the, the question of Austrian solution to Ukraine has been discussed largely in, in Europe. Uh, but of course, the, the bigger uh, uh, question mark here is a document called Budapest Memorandum. Mm -hmm. uh, because it seems that we have already been at that point uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, but uh, uh, apparently uh, for the Russian political culture, you know, s signed agreements are not uh, of that value as the American or let's say Western political culture. Mm -hmm. Well, on the first question, I agree with you that um, authoritarian regimes can use cyber attacks to undermine democratic elections in democracies, and what what we do is not going to affect the outcome of Russia's next presidential <laughs> election. Uh, and so, so I, I agree with you on, on that. In that respect, you might say it's asymmetrical. Uh, I was thinking more about uh, uh, the more dire uses of cyber attacks, which, um, uh, which can go very far. And there I think there's, as long as each side recognizes that the other has both the capacity and the will to use it, uh, they have a symmetrical, roughly equivalent interest in, in uh, reaching a deal that would lead each side to cease and desist. Uh, the Budapest memo, yeah, it became sort of uh, a political football in the, uh, in, in the course of the insurgency within, within Ukraine. And uh, yes, Russia, um, uh, has not pushed very hard for that Budapest memo to be uh, to be implemented on its own terms. I would not then go and and say that democracies are uh, faithful to their to their written uh, written words and authoritarian regimes are not. Um, I just think that's vastly overgeneralized. Uh, What's more, I, I don't buy into the notion. You know, it would be wonderful if all the world were democracies. It would be wonderful if Poland were more of a democracy at the moment. Uh, but it would be wonderful if all the world were democracies and we had a democratic peace based upon the premise, hope, belief that democracies don't go to war with each other. But that's not the world we live in. So the question then becomes, how are you going to um, create understandings between authoritarian and, and democratic regimes that will avoid bad things that neither of them wants to happen. Uh, we've had a pretty good relationship with China uh, since the late 1970s. And they're, they're an authoritarian regime for sure. And uh, I think that the U.S.-Chinese relationship during that the last 40 years although now it's going to get tougher as China is flexing its muscles more. But that, that 40 years of a pretty good relationship between the United States and China belies the notion that democracies and authoritarian <coughs> regimes can't, can't get along. Lloyd, I'm not saying you said that that, that that was the case. There was somebody in the bet. No, no, wait. There's a man, I think he left. Right. Yes, okay. Um, yes, sir. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on uh, Russia's response to the human rights violations in Chechnya and how sort of U.S.-Russian relations might impact those responses. Um, <coughs> Russia's response to human rights violations in Chechnya, uh, well, those human rights violations take many, many forms. Chechnya is a, a tyrannical political regime down there. Uh, imposed by Moscow, protected by Moscow, and uh, Moscow, after all, in quelling the Chechen insurgency, used scorched earth tactics, and uh, uh, was was not did, did not treat Chechnya at all with with uh, kid gloves. Yeltsin, after he saw the price in the mid 1970s of trying to prosecute that war, got out. But then, when Putin came in. Um, and the Chechen insurgency was, was growing, uh, he decided he was going to make sure that this time we win. Uh, 
decisively. The human rights violations in Chechnya, to my mind, are simply a product of the type of regime in power there. Um, if, and I think Putin's attitude is, you know, whatever keeps order. Like it or not. <laughs> George, uh, <clears throat> I find it very easy to agree with your narrative as a matter of fact. I, I'm inclined to congratulate you. It was a breath of fresh air to take the discourse beyond in invective and so on. O on the other hand, and, and this is no contradiction, I can see reasons for more profound pessimism about the improvement of this relationship. Number one is that the relationship is now, again I use the word, profoundly ideologized. This is not a 19th century type of great power relationship, it's a Cold War type of uh, relationship as far as West European and American liberal progressives are concerned because Putin is the number one prime example in uh, the contemporary world of a political regime of particularism and social traditionalism. That's one thing. They lost the American liberal side. I don't, don't believe whether it's a minor behavioral issue, but there is no sympathy toward Putin either among the European or among American liberals. Number two, what about the conservative realists? And here, I think <coughs> they are losing Putin or vice versa or the balance of power because they, f they understand that they, they can count on Putin <coughs> as an ally against, let's say, Islamic terrorism. That's clear. However, they would like to recruit him as a balancing factor against the rise of China. And here the West have <coughs> lost Russia under Putin because they want to shy away. I mean, they are willing to pay power politics but not get involved in the uh, Chinese-American relationship or, or take <coughs> anti-Chinese stances. So that uh, you lose the uh, uh, American foreign policy traditionalists. What is left are the European conservatives. And the European conservatives, I am inclined to predict, will be in the next few years drifting toward Putin. So you're even more pessimistic than I am. Pardon me? So you're even more pessimistic than I am because uh, of the well, way you describe I, that trend. I, I, exactly. Yeah. I cannot quite <laughs> See, I, I like to start from, from the liberal international order, which, if led essentially by the United States, and the United States did magnificent things in the post-World War II era vis-a-vis -vis the stabilization of Europe, both economically and politically and militarily, and uh, uh, introduced multilateral organizations uh, you know, that, uh, that have stabilized the international economy. Um, the question then is whether the kind of leadership that the United States thought it could exercise in that period and going forward for several decades is still appropriate to the era in which we live. And that gets down to your conception of American power. That is to say, power as the ability to get people to do what you want them to do that they didn't want to do. Okay, So you can bribe them. You can, you can exhort them or you can coerce them. Uh, I just don't think the United States has shown that it still has the capability to do that or the wisdom to do it well. Um, on, on, the, on the issue of 19th century, uh, you know, when I asked the question, is, uh, is it possible to have a collective leadership in the international system? I go back to the concert of Europe. Now, there, there it was regimes that had a certain complementarity of values, and that made the concert of Europe capable of keeping the peace for much of 19th century, uh, much of the 19th century in Europe. Um, and it sure beat 
what happened in the first half of the 20th century in Europe. Uh, and so that, then I ask myself, well, okay, China is coming on, but they're not driven by a missionary ideology analogous to Maoism or, or the missionary ideology that the Soviets espoused over time. Um, th they, they're much more pragmatic, and so I would put them in the broader category of sort of a status quo power. I mean, status quo does not mean stasis, that they're spreading their political and economic influence, yes, but they're not on the march in, in, in the sense of uh, the way Maoism was supporting national liberation movements throughout the world and so on. They're not in an anti-imperialist struggle. Uh, the European Union is essentially a status quo organization. The uh, Russia is, you know, espousing balance of power and spheres of influence is essentially a status quo power. And if the United States were able to temper its missionary streak and become more of a status quo power, you could have a security council of the United States, China, Russia, Britain, and France that would not necessarily be as explicitly uh, collusive um, uh, as, as was the concert of Europe, but that could, uh, uh, could find solutions to a lot of problems that <coughs> currently look vexing. We'll have a chance to talk about this in the future. <laughs> I look forward to our lunch. Yes. Hi. A great talk, George. Um, I wanted to ask about the Obama administration and their and their attempt to reset the relationship with yeah. Russia, and what you know what could they have done differently? What went well? What did they do well? I know you talked about Syria and Crimea and this um, mismatch of crusader and pragmatic impulses, um, but I want like if if you were to you know what what is your reflection on the yeah. Obama administration and the relationship to Russia? Well, there was initially a reset. And during the, the first couple of years of that reset, on minor issues, there, were some, there was some progress. Uh, but uh, Libya happened on Obama's watch, and uh, that was for, for Putin so anger-inducing that he started to uh, wonder about whether Obama was somebody he could work with on terms that he could accept. Uh, so I think there was an initial reset that went a little bit in some areas, but nothing dramatic, major, no breakthrough. And I don't think Obama really, really had either the inclination or the perspective uh, that would be required to have really made that relationship go far. <coughs> so, for example, um, when Obama in his second inaugural address said Russia is just a regional power. Yeah. Can you imagine how that, how that was received in Moscow? Um, so that, that was, you know, and then, and then Ash Carter with his existential threat. So they're a regional power that's an existential threat to the United States. So they're, they're, we don't have to take them seriously except we have to deter them. Um, so I don't, you know, Obama had initial instincts that were good. Um, I don't think it helped that, that during his second term he sent to Moscow as an ambassador somebody who, rightly or wrongly in Moscow, was viewed as, as vociferously anti-Putin. Um, I don't think that helped. Uh, so it just, it's just stalled and they just sort of went on separate tracks and after a while they developed a mutual contempt for each other, Putin and Obama. Yes, yes. Um, so um, you seem to have the narrative that the recent conflict, excuse me, the recent <laughs> conflict with the election um, um, and Russia, Russia's uh, supposed intervention in our election is um, another way of um, Putin expressing anger and backlash, getting back at the United States. It um, would seem to me that my it's a funny way of um, kind of punishing the regime. I mean, I know that Hillary Clinton and the Obama State Department was kind of a uh, target of his animosity, but what is the incentive for Russia to support um, right-wing candidates in the U.S. and in Western Europe? Is there like an ideological affinity? Is it 
um, simply a way of exercising the muscle <coughs> of Russia's cyber apparatus. Uh, why is that a strategy, or is it strategy okay. at all? Certainly, you know, every indication is that Putin has been trying to support right-wing forces in both Eastern and Western Europe. He was a fan of Le Pen's candidacy in, in, in France. Uh, he's uh, quite <coughs> thrilled by what's been happening in Hungary and Poland in terms of, of uh, a tightening authoritarian regime in both, and now probably increasingly, <coughs> increasingly in the Czech Republic as well. Uh, so I think affinity is a good word, um, ideological affinity. But bear in mind <coughs> the context. If one of your, the sources of your anger is democracy promotion, then anything that is rolling back democracy on his borders or near his borders looks like uh, uh, something of an inoculation against, uh, against that trend. Um, as far as the election is concerned, look, uh, he had the capability, because uh, he had used it in other places uh, within the former Soviet Union, uh, Donald Trump was saying nice things about Putin during the campaign and was saying bad things about NATO. So talk about affinity. And if he didn't already believe that Donald Trump was somebody he could, uh, he could work with, he, uh, in hearing that, seeing Donald Trump questioning American foreign commitments to NATO, and presumably also to democracy promotion, he, um, he would have an incentive to use his capability to try to increase the chances that Trump would win. Whether he has, has um, blackmail material on Trump, I don't know. But as another Russian journalist said to me, if Trump was in Moscow in the last few years and was uh, was doing hanky panky in his hotel room. They probably got it on film because <laughs> it's been because they, you know, Trump has been talking about becoming president of the United States for quite a while. Um, uh, so, but you know, I can't speak with authority to to what they have over him. Money laundering is another possibility. Uh, I don't reject those possibilities because uh, they're entirely plausible to me given the logic of the situation. We have two left. We only have two questions, uh, uh, and uh, I have them on my list. Yes. Do you have a question? No. Okay. Anybody here? Did you have a question? Yeah. Do you have any advice on how to counter the, the propaganda that is so shrill in both countries on television? It's it's just astonishing how many months it's kept on and on and on. <coughs> With, without any real substantial evidence, and some reporters are actually saying is alleged, and there's no substantial evidence. Right, right. I, I don't, really, I don't <laughs> really know what the what the magic bullet is in that regard. Uh, you have a spiral of mutual <coughs> contempt going on uh, in Washington. Any any politician who gave my speech would be roasted <laughs> and probably isolated. Uh, within the political but establishment. It's, such an old game. I mean, it's, it's an old game, and I think it's driven also. And here, I'm going to go out on a limb and present a hypothesis. If you're going to put this up on the web, I'll probably ca catch flack for it. But, you know, journalism in the face of that kind of hysteria, journalists have to worry about maintaining their access to their sources. So they don't want to be defined by a large swath of the political establishment as mm -hmm. irresponsible, right? Yes, yeah, Steve and Cohen has gotten a lot of flack. Who? Steve Cohen. Yeah, no, he's not a journalist, but uh, yeah, he's, he's a public intellectual. Uh, but you know, if you have to keep, <coughs> keep putting um, articles into major newspapers and based upon access to people who are willing to speak to you, um, if you come out with the kind of argument that I made, you're, you're probably going to uh, lose some of your access. And that, for journalists, is their lifeblood. Um, as, for, as for Moscow, um, there is, within the political elite in Moscow, you know, a very strong contempt for American foreign policy. 
Putin's pragmatic streak means he's retrievable, but I don't know how many of the people around him will be. Uh, however, since it is an authoritarian regime, if he pivots, probably they'll pivot with him. No, 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 no. no oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Yes, ma'am. Too off of all things. Uh, one, George, good speech. Thank you. Thank you I'm sir. glad to hear what you had to say and that you said it. Um, uh, the first thing is um, since we have no access, but to our, since there's no talking between these two countries at the top level, uh, people like, um, well, there's some people in Washington and other places that are saying it's time for people to start doing something again. People's mm -hmm. diplomacy, they're calling it. And in this room, we have a few of us who are veteran citizen diplomats. And uh, I wonder if you think there's any chance that there's anything that we could do that might begin to start the ball rolling. And I would like to talk with you too, because I've started one of CTI's programs again, and I'm going to be having four Russians here, and I would love to see you <coughs> be a part of this, and they'll be coming in March. Uh, but at any rate, the, the program that we did was very successful in the 80s, mm. is because we just simply got both the, the peoples of both countries together here in the United States. And thanks to the workshop, because he allowed the exit business for people that were street people and not, yeah. five, not um, the uh, party people. But at any rate, I think we can start that again. And it looks like we're going to be able to get visas, U.S. visas. I've talked with uh, the council gentleman, hopefully we'll talk with uh, John Huntsman soon, uh, the next time I go back, but about getting visas for this. They're open to it. Uh, and so what do you think? Do you think there's any possibility that those of us who have got this years, decades of experience could be able to do something here? Yeah. That Before you answer, if I can give, I'll let you have a quick question, one question, and I'll have him, and then I'll have, I'll have satisfied most everybody. Okay. Well, so Professor, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to know a little bit more on your opinions on the Russia's war with Afghanistan. I know it's you know the last question that just you know caused the fact that the Russians walked away because they just couldn't deal with the war there. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. You're the last. Yeah. Oh, ask the question. Yes, you oh, Okay. Uh, perhaps you can address the uh, economic uh, motivators. You talked about the dynamics between the countries. But when I look at, for example, China, which is primary focus is its economy and looks at its military as a secondary, and then I look at Russia, which has a relatively weak economy, uh, very oil dependent, but is really pushing its military. And you could also throw on North Korea, which has a very, very weak economy, pushing its military. How do you contrast those two? Because many times, the, the reason you do uh, venture, adventurism in military is to distract your own population from the economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, okay. Um, <coughs> on citizen diplomacy, you know, it can't hurt. And uh, it's, you know, if you have the energy and the experience <coughs> and the will to, to uh, pursue it, uh, well, God bless you. Um, what, if Ligachov had been chosen uh, for secretary or general secretary of the party in 1985, Radulin Gorbachev, mm. citizen diplomacy would not have had the impact that it had. Uh, so what you're doing with citizen diplomacy, I think, is setting the stage for whenever a political opening happens to occur for other reasons. And so it can't hurt and it can help if that political opening uh, reveals itself. Uh, and sometimes it takes a, uh, a scary <coughs> crisis for an opening to reveal itself. So maybe that's the path we're going to end up going historically. Uh, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in December of 1979. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, um, they went in thinking it would be a three-week war. Uh, that's what their military commanders told them. Uh, instead, they got mired in the equivalent of, v of what the United States is having been mired in Vietnam. Uh, they stuck it out until Gorbachev came to power. And they, they took the, the losses, uh, which were growing in part because of the uh, the, the United States is giving Stinger uh, anti-tank missiles and anti-aircraft anti, uh, missiles to the Afghan, um, the, the Afghan insurgents. And uh, 
uh, when Gorbachev came in, one of the first things he said, uh, although he didn't broadcast it loudly in public, was, uh, we're getting out. We're getting out of Afghanistan regardless by such and such date. And when that date approached, they got out. They got out, and you might say they cut and ran. Um, but um, uh, Gorbachev was insightful enough to realize when he was pursuing an unattainable goal. As far as uh, the military and the economy is concerned, um, from what I read about China, they are now investing a portion of their surplus in rapidly building up their military. But the economy has always been first in the military. <coughs> the economy has been first, absolutely, absolutely. Now, uh, the Russian military was in disarray in, in the 1990s, which is part of the reason that they, uh, they couldn't defeat the insurgents in Chechnya uh, in, in 94 and 5 and got out in 96. Uh, Putin has been rebuilding the military and doing a pretty good job of it with the surplus that they generate. Uh, some people argue that the Russian economy is on a downward slide now. Um, uh, I mean, you can see surface indicators of it, you know, how much of the national wealth is being siphoned off to corruption, how much to big projects that make people feel good like the Sochi Olympics <coughs> but don't really expand the economy's reach. Um, and that, uh, that the, the, the lack of modernization of the governance of firms is, uh, is coming back to, to bite them, and the over-dependence upon oil, natural gas, and those resources is coming back to bite them. Uh, that, may be, that may be accurate, um, but you know, to go from rapid growth to less rapid growth to not, not rapid growth at all, but just some growth, um, you could extrapolate from that straight line and, and, and reach the conclusion that they're going under. Uh, or you could uh, extrapolate from that that it's now gotten bad enough that they're going to make reforms that are going to make it better. Or you could extrapolate from that that low growth is sustainable. Well, please join me in uh, thank you, President. Thank you. And you and I have to skid out. Yep, you have to go. Thank you. Russia has chased somebody like me to ride out the model. And there are people around you going out.